Good morning and welcome to worship here on this 12th of July. This Sunday we begin a new series, an eight-week series looking at the book of Acts, and we're calling it Acts, Adventures in Being Church. The Gospel of Luke tells the story of Jesus' ministry. That same author continues the story of ministry in the book of Acts, focusing on how the story of Jesus was spread to the world. Jesus' followers, having just experienced the trauma of his death, then the joy of his resurrection, once again found themselves challenged to carry on after his ascension. How could they be the church, the body of Christ? Join us in these coming weeks as we consider the stories and obstacles those early Christians faced. Let us look at these ancient texts with new eyes, for we too are in the midst of many challenges, doubts, and uncertainties. And now we can ask ourselves the same question. How can we be the body of Christ, the church, right now? Good morning. As we gather to worship this morning, let's raise our voices together with our opening song of praise. Moses wrote much of the law that guided Israel for much of its history. His writings established core values for the people to live by. Deuteronomy 15 lays down the groundwork upon which Jesus and the apostles built many similar Christian values. Hear these words. I'm reading Deuteronomy chapter 15, 7 through 11. If there is among you anyone in need, 
a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it might be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking, the seventh year, the year of remission, is near. And therefore, view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so. For on this account, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and the needy neighbor in your land. Friends, I invite you to just take a minute now to get somewhere comfortable and take some time to pray together. There's much for us to pray about. And some of it's very hard to put into words. So during this prayer time, there will be some quiet moments, perhaps with some quiet background music, for you to simply relax and let go and feel the presence of God wherever you are right now. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we come to you in this time of prayer with open and contrite hearts doing our best to let go of all of our agendas, doing our best to focus our thoughts on you and not run wild with all the many things that come before us that tend to push you away. As we come at this time, we we too often approach this time with all the things that we want to say, that we want to offer to you to make sure that you hear. We want to talk to you about how tough this pandemic is for not only us, but for the whole world, how hard it is for people who don't have jobs, how, how lonely it is for people who are isolated. But the truth is you know all those things. What we don't do often enough is just sit in silence and allow your presence to wash over us. We now take a moment to cherish that silence and to cherish your presence in this time of prayer. Holy God, even as we hear the sounds of the world, wherever we are, whether it's the sound of children in our household, or the sound of vehicles going by, or an airplane flying over, or so many different things, remind us again that you are here with us 
You do not leave us or forsake us. Our lives are wrapped up in you, and you are wrapped up in this world. That you love us, you love, you love all people, you love creation. Help us to take strength from that truth. To see beyond the short term. To see the big picture of your love. We pray all this in Jesus' name, the very one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? It's really nice to know that you're out there listening to us. You know, when I was little, we used to do something, and I don't know if all of you know this or not, but we're going to give it a try. I'll show you what I did as a little girl, and we'll see if you know it. So, we used to put our fingers together like this, and our thumbs up, and say, here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the doors, and see all the people. 
And you know, that makes me think of the early church because in the early church, they didn't always have a building, but they would get together with their friends in people's homes or out in the temple courtyard and they would gather together to learn about God and to learn about Jesus and to pray together. And you know, in these days, we're not always able to get into our church building. Like this year, VBS, you headed outdoors. You were at the church, but you were sharing the word of God outside instead of inside the building. And that's an example of how the church really is the people. And in the early days of the church, they concentrated on gathering together to learn from the, about the apostles' teaching, which we do that. You do it on Zoom now with your Sunday school teachers and to fellowship with each other, which we've had Zoom fellowship after church, and I've seen a few of you there, and breaking bread and praying together. So, you know, the church isn't the building, it's the people. And so I want you to think about, you know, what can we do to help share the word and to help others? So I thought about it a lot and I thought, you know, you could invite friends to join us in Zoom Sunday School, or maybe you could call up some of your friends from your Sunday school class and get together and have a picnic in the park so you can eat together and you can fellowship together, but still stay safely apart and share the word of God. So, we well, thought about some of the things that the early church did and that we do also, and I have a list here. Let's see if you recognize any of these things that we do. They wanted to learn about God, so they got together. They ate together, and we did that last week. We had communion together, but sometimes after church, families will go out to lunch together. They looked for miracles, and you know, I see them all the time when I look into your smiling faces. You guys are fantastic. And they shared with others, and we do that all the time. We've collect at church, we collect coats for the Johnson County Christmas Bureau, or we collect school supplies for those that need help because they can't really afford them. We're going on We Care Wednesdays and helping people. So our church is pretty good about sharing. In fact, I know somebody that goes and does the grocery shopping for another member so they don't have to go out to a store or we take meals to people when they're sick or if they've had a baby. And we just look for ways that we can help. So I want you to work on that this week. Think of ways you can help other people so that you can share God's word just by your actions and we can continue to praise God together and that will help grow the church. So let's close in a prayer, which everybody should do in church. And when I get to the end, I'm gonna say, and all the people said, and you say really, really loud, amen. Dear God, we thank you for our church building, but more importantly, we thank you for the people in our church. They are what makes this a special place. They share your word with us. They help teach us. They pray with us. They care for us and they care for others. We care for people that we don't, haven't even met. And so we just thank you for the love that you give us and help us to share that word with others so that we can grow the church. In Jesus name we pray. And all the people said, amen. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.
I'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community on that day. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals and their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and they shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and they ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Hey folks, do you remember Pentecost? Do you remember when we did all this crazy stuff a while back? Well, after the tongues of fire and the whirlwind experience, Peter preaches to the crowd and he calls for repentance and baptism, turning around to a new way of life. And he spoke in defense of those who were thought to be drunk. And the result? 3,000 people were added to their number that day. Hey, everybody, guess what? We have 3,000 first-time visitors with us today. How do you respond? I read one story where a woman, upon hearing this part of the story, said, this meant a lot of work for the people in the kitchen. And I pictured the UMW in that. Because they all broke bread together. 3,000 people. Plus all the people who were already there. In a very practical way, she saw that people would need to be fed. Accommodations would have to be made for some. Today, for instance, we would need to make sure that they all had masks. But imagine the ripple effect of such unbelievable hospitality. They opened their arms to what many scholars believe was a very diverse group of people, given the time in Jerusalem when this occurred. We know from the beginning of the story that many nations were represented and the people heard each in their own language. It was an incredibly challenging moment in time. And the journey only started for all these newly baptized. This new church, if you will, needed to help them understand that repentance ultimately leads to a new sense of social responsibility. Converts had much to learn. Who God is, who Jesus was and is, and what he taught. How all are called to follow and model after Jesus. And so, in light of all that, those very closest to him, the apostles, taught. Now, many of these truths and tasks are still with us. A lot of this makes sense for understanding who the church is called to be. Teaching is obvious. The Christian life of faith requires learning, listening, study to gain perspective, to hear things in the appropriate context, knowing that certain passages were written to certain groups of people in specific, unique situations. I think we also have an understanding for koinonia, which is the concept of being the church community together in fellowship, and the importance of shared meals, of, of which Holy Communion, the Eucharist, is a central part. For the most part, we still practice prayer, perhaps in many different ways, but we clearly hold it up as a central part of the practice of faith, as a strength of the community. It's interesting, the wording in the passage I read says their prayers, which might imply that certain prayers were said on certain days and times and by large groups of people, perhaps likening it to the Book of Common Prayer, so that many voices would unite together to pray the exact same words kind of like when we do the Lord's Prayer. Where we begin to run into trouble into, in using this early Jerusalem community as a model of faith is the passage about sharing everything and selling property and possessions to give to the community and the good of all. Throughout Christian history, communities seldom put this into practice. 
It happened, but not very often. Now, we clearly love all the other parts of this story, but it seems like we try to find ways around or explain away this part, why they did this. Obviously, they did it to see to everyone's needs, which, by the way, is a big word. And they did it to demonstrate God's goodness. But it runs counter to a lot of human tendencies, doesn't it? The culture surrounding the early church was communal. Ours is not. The American rugged individual persona endemic in our culture may hinder our ability to remember that the communal benevolence practiced by the early church was quite different. Could it even be that the purpose of repentance in this story is to redirect our view from self-centered navel-gazing to compassionate consideration of others? Let's be clear. Their communal understanding didn't simply pop into their heads because of the Holy Spirit. Its roots are in the deepest teachings of Moses. In Deuteronomy 15, hear these words, There will, however, be no one in need among you. That's verse 4. And if there is any among you in need, a member of your community, in any of your towns, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. Verse 7. So we must be aware of dismissing this passage about possessions too easily. Most of us, it appears, have no desire to live in this fashion and are thus probably overly motivated to find reasons not to do so. Note that it is no coincidence that this activity follows the powerful gift of the Spirit and the performance of miracles. This suggests that where God is especially at work and where God's presence is essentially and especially experienced, such giving and sharing is the natural Christian response. I wonder, are we becoming so distant from that vital experience of unity? I know I feel it when I'm doing mission trips, but maybe not as often during the rest of the year. What would it look like today? There are still parts of the world that view possessions as being primarily for the benefit of community and not private. In parts of the South Pacific, it isn't uncommon for possessions to be shared and used by persons who are in need the most. Food, clothing, tools. Keep in mind the response of the Acts community was not a political movement, but a communal one, driven by a newly awakened understanding of how we are indeed all in this together. Fifty years ago, and I guess I can't believe I'm actually counting that high in remembering this story, my father, who was appointed to a multi-point charge in East Central Kansas, was speaking of these same questions and looking at these same scriptures. Now, I attended with him often when I was in college, but I attended with him that day and that morning in particular because there was a heavy rain and there were really muddy roads that Sunday. And I knew he needed me to help him push him out of the mud if necessary between churches. Following the service, one of the prominent members of that 15-member congregation called my dad a communist. Dad and I rode home together and kind of laughed and talked out loud on the way home and made it clear that he followed Christ, not Marx. But people hear what they hear, I guess. See, this passage is about recognizing our God-given common humanity and finding ways to live out that truth. Today, I believe we may see some turning points before us. Call them repentance moments, if you will, in which we may be able to seriously look at ourselves and perhaps more importantly at all of the diverse people around us as persons with whom we hold very much in common. I guess a global pandemic reveals our common vulnerability. Who to thunk? The story today is about make, making hospitality real, evident in our behavior. 
We may not sell all our possessions, but will our generosity grow as we recognize others' needs and our common humanity? It could start very simply. Maybe by just wearing a mask to control this virus and thus help get people back to work and to better lives. In these next several weeks, let's take an honest look at ourselves and what it means to be the body of Christ, the church. Don't expect any easy answers from me. Probably a lot of questions, more likely. But I believe together we can learn much and do much. Peace be with you. Amen. Let's join our voices together this morning for our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be the Friends, let us, let us now take leave of this place. This place that we have so much come to appreciate. Let's once again start the journey. In these coming weeks, as we begin to think about who we are, and especially about who the church is, and how we are the church, may we not forget that these four walls will someday disappear. But that your love will never fail us. Amen.